Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of The Jump Seat. Uh, for those of you guys who are new to The Jump Seat, Jump Seat, it's a weekly spotlight bringing you key industry thought leaders, subject matter experts, and maybe a better look at um, insight into some of the tools and technology uh, for uh, uh, the future affecting your fire departments today. It's uh, brought to you by myself, David Durstein, and my uh, cohort in crime here, uh, John Martins. How's it going? Good to be here and, again, Dave. Uh, absolutely. It's always fun to be here on a Friday afternoon. And uh, so uh, for those of you guys who don't know us, we're a couple of uh, uh, jump seat firemen. Uh, I've been doing it for 23 years, John, 13 plus years. Uh, both spent some time in, in the professional side of things as well as that combination and volunteer departments. Um, and so we're going to take you on a, a little trip today and uh, um, uh, talk about some key happenings in the fire service as well as uh, some new technology in the rescue tool world. Uh, and so I, I think we got a great show uh, in store. Uh, I first just want to apologize. We're running a little bit late here. We had some technical difficulties getting started right at three o'clock. So for those of you guys who are out there hanging out, uh, I apologize for that, but hope you've uh, had a chance to tune in. Uh, so uh, we're glad to be here again and uh, uh, are excited to bring you this show here today. So John, um, you know, it's kind of a crazy week in the fire service. Uh, what do you yeah. got happening for us? Yeah, Dave, thanks. Uh, and again, thanks everybody being patient here today. I, I, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of positive things to share just on the note of uh, some of the news we've been seeing the last few days, especially, but um, there's a lot of unrest going on, uh, especially in that Minneapolis uh, hub and, and other places too that I'm starting to see from some of the, the articles. And I just, it's unfortunate. And I, I guess my, you know, my thoughts got to everybody on those calls right now and, and in the beat in the streets. And my, my advice is just to, you know, keep maintain situational awareness of what's going on around you. And uh, let's just, I guess, work as a team to deescalate this as much as we can, despite uh, what's, what's, what's going on. So, yeah, you know, I mean, we had uh, what Chief Gasway on here two weeks ago, and uh, he, he did that talk on situa situational awareness a, a little bit there. And, who would have thought that we would be talking about that here today and um, and the relevance of it, um, particularly in his backyard of Minneapolis as well. Right. So, um, you know, I know it's uh, it's probably crazy out there. So to all you uh, brother firefighters uh, in Minneapolis and other cities where some of the protests are taking place, um, be careful, be safe and uh, keep your heads held high um, and um, watch out for those PD officers as well, you know. Uh, let's keep them all in uh, in in, uh, in good graces and and uh, and helping them uh, stay positive and uh, as well. That's right. You know, um, I kind of had a little bit of the news I was going to share today, John. Uh, kind of bringing things to my neck of the woods again, and I hate to do this all the time, but it seems like we're relevant in the local Ohio area here recently. And um, so. Canton, Ohio. Uh, I don't know if you caught this in the news. They had a, a fire. I think it was on Tuesday night at a um, ammunition factory, specifically 50 caliber ammunition uh, at BMG Supply. And um, so there, there was reports as they pulled up on scene of rounds uh, firing off and sporadically throughout the, the fire event. And so, you know, I'm glad that nobody was injured. It was a safe event. They were able to extinguish that fire, but, you know, it brings up uh, an interesting topic and, and I'm gonna just throw this to you, John. I, I know I have been on runs uh, and have had instances where um, we've had, uh, you know, guns booby trap in the door. We've had um, rounds go off randomly inside. Uh, how about you? you? You got any stories around that? You had any experiences with uh, ammunition and fires? Yeah, the, the closest thing to that, Dave, would be uh, it was uh, actually a, it was an RV fire, a full size fifth wheel, or a, well, full size RV, and had a, a propane bottle explode. I think it was a 30 pounder. And, um, believe it or not, I, I don't recall the auditory blast, even though it was, I'm sure, extremely loud. I remember the concussion. That's what stuck with me. And and that also goes along with just some of our senses during stress. And we talked about it with Chief Gasway, but I had some auditory exclusion yeah. of, that, of the impact of that. But I do feel, and I can still remember that shock wave of the concussion hitting me because I was just a few feet away. So that's my quick oh, story on uh, that. But yeah, pretty wild. <laughs> You know, it's uh, they're they're always a little bit on that that scary side. Anytime you have them like that, and uh, you know, th those kind of uh, situations are even even more horrific as you get an explosion or a blast. And, 
Yeah. You know, I, I can remember vividly my first experience with ammunition on a call was actually my very first working structure fire as a firefighter. And, uh, you know, ironically that day, um, we were a, a, a smaller crew on the, a five man crew. We had our, our chief was actually riding up front and a captain driving the truck and then three probies, uh, in the back. Uh, and so we were all within our first year of firefighting, a couple of us more so in the last couple months. And, uh, so it's a ranch style home with an attic fire. And so we come in, we find a uh, access up through a closet. It's kind of going over top the basement stairs and we can kind of go up through a scuttle hole. And so I happen to be on the nozzle there, pop the scuttle hole, open one up and kind of put the nozzle through, flipped it around a little bit. And I, um, I felt something there. We, we didn't have really good visibility uh, as we were climbing up in that scuttle hole. And so I had something against my leg, didn't really pay attention to it, but I felt my partner behind me actually kind of push me to the side and pull whatever that was out. And uh, I really had no idea what it was, but I, I was standing there with a loaded 12 gauge shotgun between my legs that I was now working over. And uh, so uh, he had seen it, got it out, handed it to the next guy, got it out of the house. Um, wow. But uh, yeah, come to find out as we continued overhauling, I was standing on top of cases of shotgun shells as well. So, you know, uh, it, it actually, um, Wow. It's scary, but you know, you, you some of those times you you don't know what you get into. But it goes back to that situational awareness, right? Being cognizant, don't get stuck with the blinders on, right? And uh, make sure you, you pick it, take up the the full picture. And uh, I'm glad nobody got hurt at the that Canton, Ohio fire. But I know, uh, and obviously, you hear rounds, 50 caliber rounds going off. Nonetheless, it's gonna mm. it's gonna get your attention on that call. Yeah. Wow. That's thanks for sharing, Dave. That's good. Yeah, absolutely. Here. Um, and uh, that being said, um, you know, uh, let's go to the jump seat here, and uh, I want to introduce our guest. I'm excited to have him uh, with us here today. Uh, his name is uh, Mike Cannon. So Mike Cannon, he is, uh, it's great to have Mike with us. He's the VP of sales uh, for uh, Hearst Jaws of Life. You know, uh, he talks automotive with automotive manufacturers about car design, uh, new metals, and I know he spends a lot of time out in the field with end users trying to get um, their experiences as well as better insight into what is needed in the world of rescue tools. So I think we got a real expert with us today. And, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about technology and what's changing in, in technology within the rescue tool market. Um, so, uh, Mike, thank you for joining us. I know you've got an immense background in the fire service and in rescue tools, and I, I don't want to hold anything back. I'll let you kind of share a little bit about that. And then, uh, Maybe we'll dive into some questions uh, uh, that, that John and I have been pulling together to kind of uh, see if we can learn more about what's going on today. Sure, sure. Well, first, uh, Dave and John, thanks for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and to uh, talk to you guys today and, and your audience. Um, you know, don't, don't really want to talk too much about me, but the, the, the short version is uh, 26 years serving uh, firefighters and first responders. Um, joined the uh, IDEX Fire and Safety family about 10 years ago. Um, and have been leading the Hearst team uh, in, the, in field work uh, for about five years. Uh, it's just been a real pleasure. I uh, love working for IDEX. These guys uh, understand first and foremost that investment and innovation is what is most important. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure. Um, but anyway, fire away. Uh, would love to talk new car tech. Um, yeah. I guess, uh, you know, what, what are the biggest things on your mind? And, and let's get into it. Yeah, Mike, Absolutely. thanks again Absolutely. For, for joining us. Uh, the first question that we've kind of put together when, when, we, when we talked with, with Dave and I is, is really, you know, fill us in a little bit, fill in the gaps. What do you think are the biggest issues or changes in the auto industry uh, driving such, such speedy uh, innovation, tool design changes, you know, vehicle changes? Tell us a quick, I know we only have, you know, the jump seat isn't a real lengthy show, so we can't go too far, but give us, paint a little picture from a, maybe a higher elevation on what we're looking at right now. All right. Well, anyone who knows me, brevity is not my strong suit, so I'll, I'll do my best here. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I, I guess in a snapshot, probably the biggest thing is we've heard so much talk about how high strength steel is changing rescue and changing um, techniques and things like that. You know, I think the conversation needs to get away from, you know, Martin Seid and Boron in, in a way, because um, this is really... Um, kind of yesterday's news, to be honest. Uh, ultra high strength steel is is getting away from just using these metals, uh, Martin Sight, uh, Boron, or Martin Siddick Boron, uh, and they're using more exotic high strength steels. And, and 
what I mean by that, if we look at uh, steel types like uh, twinning induced plasticity steel, uh, there's a million acronyms out there, trip steel, twip steel, these metals, you know, can now be stamped and shaped into extremely complex shapes. They have very good elongation property. Uh, and in the world of metallurgy, what that just means is we can take these exotic hard metals and now we can just about it. Before we only had to worry about like the A post and the B post being a problem if, you're, if your cutter was out of date. Now we're really looking at having to, in my opinion, refine techniques on a regular basis because high strength steel, I'll give you an example. It's always been traditional uh, knowledge that if you didn't have a cutter that was strong enough to get that B post out, you know, you could probably do a, 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 a B post push off, push down with your ram on the, on the rocker, go up to the roof rail and break it off. Well, now we're finding cars where the roof rail is actually stronger than the rocker. And this can lead the ram to just punch through the rocker down to the floor and you'll have a totally failed maneuver. So it's just one example where I think the prevalence of high strength steel in every part of the vehicle now is creating a need more and more for, uh, for the fire service and first responders to not look at training uh, as, a, as a once every few year event. It, it really, uh, in our opinion, it should be something that's addressed every single year. Uh, in addition, I would highly recommend that any department look at bringing in outsiders from other regions uh, in their training. And I, I think what we've found on our team is that when we bring first responders from the West Coast, the East Coast, the Midwest, all over, and we bring them together, you've, you've got great be best practices sharing so that uh, more departments don't have just a plan A and plan B. They're more like, yeah, I got A through D ready to go for every maneuver or, or for every end result we're looking for. Well, just like fire suppression, the, the, the variables are endless, right? And so with what you're saying, mm -hmm. having multiple minds here at play can only help us all collectively, so. A absolutely, I think there's the one thing that I'm seeing is people just wanting to sort of buy their way technology problems and just, just buy a bigger cutter, just buy a stronger spreader. You know, and the truth is training is more important than all that. Uh, what, what I've noticed more than anything is a first response knowledge of the high strength steel characteristics and how a maneuver is going to react based on the reinforcements. Uh, you'll notice that a skilled firefighter with very outdated will be much better off than the untrained firefighter, you know, with brand new tools. So I, I can't stress that enough. We've noticed uh, technique success uh, is, is m much more assured if, if training really, really regularly is, is uh, deployed. The, um, the other thing is the fact that um, we, we see instances where conventional wisdom that was absolutely true, even a few years ago, then you apply that same exact technique and you'll find that it's not only maybe not the best choice, but it, it really would be the wrong choice. Let's take door removals, for example. Uh, I, I think you, you, you might run into some instructors who feel like, you know, doors should always be cut off. Some feel they should always be spread off. I, my answer to that is there's no one right answer. There needs to be a situational awareness to what kind of vehicle you're dealing with and what the situation is. I'll give you an example at Mercedes-Benz. We were just proving out some new uh, prototypes and we found the lower hinge on some new Mercedes-Benz is tantamount to the kind of hinge you would see in an armored vehicle a few, uh, few years before. We could cut the hinge, it wasn't a problem, but the the strength of the steel was so incredibly strong, it caused a massive shock and for the door to violently uh, eject after that second hinge cut. Mm -hmm. We learned because of this, you know, perhaps a door spread off, cut on that top hinge and a roll off is actually a safer maneuver. So uh, it's not making anything easier for firefighters, but I think exposure to a greater variety of vehicles and really frequent training brings all this stuff out so that uh, everyone's aware that, uh, you know, you, you really have to have three, four options ready to go for everything and, and be willing to pivot to that different technique, depending on the vehicle and that exact uh, situation. You know, I mean, it's nothing, it's just like everything else in the fire service anymore, you know, uh, and, and John Gassaway, Chief Gassaway talked about this here a couple of weeks ago was, um, you know, you got to train and, and train in the moment so you can think and adapt to those varying and changing situations. And I'm almost hearing you say, 
it's almost maybe even us in education at times than it is in uh, into some of the newest technology. Am I, am I hearing that a little bit? Not that we, I'm sure you want to sell rescue tools, but uh, it sounds like education is a key piece. Well, yeah, I mean, you can combine the education piece with, with um, a need to shop, frankly, for new tools. Now, regardless of the brand you go with, let's, let's take one example. So um, the, uh, the new NFPA standard attempts to address this. So what we're seeing is a trend towards B posts with a much wider flare at the bottom where it meets the rocker. This is causing a problem because if you go to remove the B post, it's really common to want to come in to your B post parallel with a rocker uh, and make two cuts uh, from either side, right? As, yep. as everyone knows, the high strength steel is creating a situation where if the inside of the B post has a gap, the cutter is always going to swing into the patient. You know, one manufacturer, I think, came out with a really cool, innovative idea to try to address that. Uh, you know, we've taken a slightly different approach, and I think there's some other manufacturers that have similar uh, products. We've gone to a box blade design, and here's an example where I don't want to get too into uh, the specifics of selling a product, but we're trying to adapt design to the reality of new car tech. So if we have a B post with an in, internal reinforced uh, sort of rectangular inner core, what if we just have a box blade of, of sort of this shape, uh, if you will, or, or about like this, and when I, I can come into that B post from 90 degrees. So now I've got a 90 degree swing potential in either direction. So it, it just makes understanding not only the challenge, but the Maybe when you when you shop for new rescue tools, keep those things in mind. Uh, another thing I would I would mention is uh, fire departments buying or putting too much emphasis on the weight of a tool. Got to think twice. Uh, the fact is, every manufacturer out there has an all nine cutter now. Uh, and what I mean by that is an NFPA cut classification, basically being the best top yeah. score. I think every department needs to think ten years out, fifteen years out. They need to be thinking about what they were going to have to cut tomorrow. So, uh, you know, ultimately putting a little more emphasis on the strength of your tools uh, instead of just the weight of the tools. Uh, Interesting. Now, now, Mike, you kind of brought up one thing that I was going to touch on really class, and maybe, and maybe we can jump back and forth here. But you mentioned there briefly there's a new NFPA standard, and I know I've heard about it there myself. I think it's, uh, what, 1936, if I'm correct on the tool numbers. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is the status of that? Because when does it actually go into effect? And, and maybe what are some of the big changes that the fire departments should know about with that standard? Yeah, sure. Uh, good question. Uh, the, the NFPA 1936 obviously is the rescue tool standard. Um, it has the, the latest edition. It's on a five-year release schedule. So the latest edition has been released, the 2020 edition. It's already in effect. However, okay. uh, manufacturers still have till July 1st to certify product uh, through a third-party laboratory uh, agency. Uh, so so uh, consumers may see some products still labeled as NFPA 15 through uh, this next month after July 1st uh, is, is when it's in full effect. So the, the really two, there's a lot in there, but for the purposes of this show, I'll just boil it down to three important things. There's a new cut table um, that uh, basically challenges cutters to ultra high strength material. I would strongly recommend any fire department, if you don't have a cutter uh, that, um, that's in the, in the stronger classification and you're shopping for new cutters, uh, no matter whose brand you buy, I highly recommend you don't buy a cutter unless it's rated to the new F bar uh, cut standard. Uh, this cut standard is an extremely difficult test. It's a 4130 um, high strength steel uh, with uh, ever increasing profiles of a rectangular shape. This more directly replicates what's going on uh, in new car tech and, and more replicates the challenge. So a really good test. I would caution anyone against purchasing against unsubstantiated maximum cut force claims. The NFPA does not call out a third party test standard for max cut force claims. So these are, these are essentially claims by the manufacturer uh, at, in a cutter's strongest position, which is essentially fully closed. So the number for maximum cut force is completely irrelevant to anything having to do with performance. What you can actually cut, the only thing that matters. Uh, so, um, so the F-bar really, I think, is the biggest thing in there that uh, relevant to the hydraulic tools. The second thing is, the FPA 1936 now includes 
rescue lifting bags. Uh, I think this was long overdue. I'd like to applaud the chairman, uh, Glenn Mate, for, for driving uh, you, you know, a need to look at this because a lot of fire departments were, were looking for greater guidance on airbags. The most important uh, two elements of that are that uh, an admission by all the manufacturers and first responders that the fact is the, um, the nature of rescue lifting bags is such that they are not safe for use after 15 years of use, uh, or I should say 15 years from the date of manufacture. So the NFPA okay. standard under chapter six, uh, section two, is very specific that uh, your rescue lifting bags should be retired completely uh, after 15 years of use. I, I'm sorry, 15 years uh, from data manufacture. Uh, this is regardless of condition and age, uh, and it has to do with the fact that natural rubber simply has a degradation cycle that is natural. There's no way around it. Um, and that after 15 years is when the material is just potentially too compromised uh, to stay in service. Wow. Um, so Mike, great info there. I, I wanted to ask a couple things on the battery side, if that's all right. Um, you know, we yeah, do notice a strong trend towards that. And for us, you know, I know it's been around a while, but still just trending that direction. Um, what do you think's driving this aside from, I guess, just the innovation side and, and how do you see maybe, you know, the last 10 years to now and maybe what's, what's next? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. I, I know there's a lot of, um, strong, almost, I would say strong emotions around the battery tool versus the hose line tool. Um, and I'll be the first to tell you, any of those folks that were skeptical of battery tools, uh, to be honest, I don't blame you. Uh, early generation products, we've all been, you know, more than discouraged by products that use nickel metal hydride technology or NICAD technology. These battery technologies Though useful in certain applications, uh, we're very frustrating because of battery memory, uh, shortened runtime, battery longevity problems, uh, just a host of problems. Um, so the fact is, we, the, to answer the question, changed lithium ion. That is it. Comparing, I, I too, I, I way too often hear comparisons of, well, we know battery technology, we had problems with it, we're not going that way. Well, that's. That is drawing a comparison of old battery technology to lithium ion. Uh, I would argue that that comparison is similar to comparing a rotary dial phone to an iPhone 11 Pro. There is no comparison. Uh, lithium ion powers most electric vehicles. It, uh, it doesn't have memory problems. It has an incredibly slow uh, dissipation rate. So uh, any, any of these tools that, that use lithium, um, lithium ion, once the batteries are charged, they, they lose so much of their energy over months, uh, the, the same risks and problems simply don't exist. In addition, just about everybody's battery tool that I know of, you've got a 110 adapter. So you have that capability to turn any fire department generator into a potential power unit. So uh, it, it really actually creates greater cross-functional versatility by going with a battery tool because you can have corded electric, but it's still a hydraulic tool, and you can have totally hands-free battery. Um, now lithium-ion technology is getting to the point where uh, manufacturers, but in our case, uh, we've been able to get 54 cuts and up to 75 spreads on one fully charged battery. So um, the, the, the most important thing here is it's faster off the truck, there's no chance of hydraulic lockup from switching uh, from tool to tool on a power unit. You can run all tools at the same time. You can't do that with a SIMO or a TRIMO, uh, well, depending on the model. Um, and you, you, uh, you, you frankly have turned the, what we think of as an auto extrication tool into a potential everything rescue tool. You know, and I've heard people say, well, I keep my hose line tools around because of runtime. Or I keep my hose line tools around because just in case I got to go in the water. Uh, everyone's probably heard, um, you know, now we were the first, but uh, someone was soon to follow. You know, there are battery uh, tool options that you can use in water. So we've got that solved. We've got runtime solved. We even have temperature tolerance solved. Uh, battery tools can now be created. Uh, they're in service in some of the most northern parts of Canada. Uh, battery tools service in some of the hot environments in, in Latin America, Mexico City, uh, Texas, and, and places like that. So 
you know, in my opinion, I think everyone needs to, who has skepticism about battery technology, no matter the brand you go with, you need to give it a second look because now we can use these tools in collapse, uh, uh, confined space. Uh, even if you have an entrapment situation in water rescue, now we've got a tool you can apply to that. There are even hydraulic uh, rescue tools that can be used for RIT uh, for interior attack, for interior, uh, you know, fire conditions. So now the battery tool eclipses the hose line tool in total versatility, where you can take it, where you can, uh, you know, and what you can uh, do with it. So to me, there's really no comparison, but we'll certainly support hose line uh, as long as, as customers, you know, want it. And I think most manufacturers will. Hose line will be around for a long, long time. But I really think almost every department needs to look at adding a lineless tool to, to their uh, tool cache. Very interesting. You know, I, I, I guess I didn't think about it as much until you were bringing it up here, Mike, and how many times that we utilize tools today um, and maybe are doing it in completely different atmospheres than we were before. I guess when I began, everything we did was extrication, right? But now I think about it, you know, we'll grab a combi tool to pop a door, uh, not to a car, but forcible entry, right? Um, well, it's just a different way of thinking, I guess. And maybe the, I guess the movement of battery is really helping that. Is that the case? Yeah, absolutely. Let, let's look at another example. So let's say you come up to a car fire. Victims are out. No problem. We don't have an immediate uh, patient concern. You're really just looking at a suppression issue. Um, you know, what are, what are so many departments instincts? You know, grab your set of irons, slap your halogen into the corner of that hood, peel it back. Well, you know, a spread, a battery powered spreader, I can pull off and I can have that hood breached in, in seconds, in just, uh, just a few seconds. So uh, in a lot of cases, it can simply execute what you, what you have the capability of doing anyway, but we can do it faster, we can do it safer, we can do it more quickly. So uh, you know, just, a, just another example. Uh, I, think you hit on, I think you hit on two things right there, right? Uh, so faster efficiency is a big one and safer. And you know, those are big things that I, I think if you look at and I'm going to go back to the IDEX fire and safety kind of company line. And those are kind of things we, we do in the water flow side. I know you're on the rescue side, but as a whole, as a business, you know, trying to make firefighters more effective, more efficient in their job. But you know what, if we can improve safety, that's a key, a key piece, no matter how you look at it, uh, whether it be a, a new nozzle technology, whether it be SAM in the water flow or, you know, battery powered tools utilizing forcible entry uh, in a safer, more effective manner. Uh, I, I love hearing that. That's great stuff. Well, it's just like anything yeah. else in life. What you put into it, you get out of it. Meaning, yes, you can have the best tools. Yes, you can have subpar tools, but with the right training and, and mindset and mm -hmm. passion, you can make, you know, the most and really maximize your effect on your community through that. And so, yeah, they go, they all go together, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, so, I, I couldn't stress that enough. I mean, the biggest thing that, that I see out of so many demos where we're selling tools, I find the more gratifying part is when you know you've connected and we've shown a new technique and a, and a department walks away with something better than a new tool. They walk away with a new set of go-to techniques that add to their list of, of uh, you know, possible uh, actions. And, uh, you know, that, that's what education success is the breadth of your knowledge and that is only going to come with really more frequent training the auto industry is changing too fast to go to an extrication training every few years in my opinion it's really got to be a, an annual thing uh only pausing because uh one of my hosts on my screen is has frozen solid oh, oh yeah i don't see dave so, Mike, uh, you still good I think we're still good. There's Dave. I think we're still in good. In and out a little bit. That's okay. Sorry about that. But so, hey, can you tell so it's I, live? I guess <laughs> it, it is live, you know. And hey, sometimes you can't you can't control what happens in the in the internet world, right? So unfortunately, but uh, we deal with those cards as they're played. That's uh, right. So so Mike, I think about when when it comes to like my department and training and um, you know how would I go if I wanted to get training for my department. Um, if I, if I want to get a hold of you or your team, how, how, what's the best way to go about that? All right. Well, plug time, honestly, uh, you know, we've got a, uh, I would say an army, uh, of excellent rescue specialists. Uh, everyone on staff is, uh, either current or former, um, 
rescue personnel from a fire, fire department in their home state. Our dealer network uh, all has uh, either current or ex uh, first responders as rescue specialists. Um, our, their collective mandate is to get out there and not just sell tools, but to share knowledge and uh, host training, uh, share what we've learned from the car. Reach us real easily at jawsoflife.com. Uh, we have a dealer locator right on the website, uh, uh, or you can um, uh, reach us at our 800 number. I'll be honest, I don't have it memorized, but it's right there on the website. And it can direct you to any one of uh, a host of dealers across the country uh, that would be happy to deploy their rescue specialists with uh, full demo trucks. Uh, so you can try out just about anything uh, we make uh, from the Hearst Jaws of Life line or the uh, Better Pneumatics uh, Rescue Lift line. Awesome, awesome. Super. Well, I, I, too, I, I am so glad you, you jumped on with us in the jump seat here today. And I know we kind of got a chance to kind of do a little wrap up plug, but I got to ask because there's just been some fun stuff that John and I went across as we were re searching rescue tools in use and stuff. And so I got to really know, um, we kind of ran across this little Facebook video that kind of was going viral about maybe uh, an eight. Oh. oh, I lost him again. <laughs> I lost his audio. <laughs> Good old technology. Uh, if he comes back, yeah. great. If not, we'll keep things moving here. Um, Mike, I, I guess you kind of said your piece. Uh, ATM robbery taking place. Oh. and There he is. Oh, there he is. Am I back? You're back. back? We, we missed your story. Oh, yeah, I hate we this. missed you a couple seconds. We'll try one more time. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. It's okay. Okay. We, we caught a video. I caught a video of, uh, of some, some robbers utilizing rescue tools that they were either stolen or I don't know how they got them, but borrowed. you know, they are you seeing them. this? Is this, is this a problem? They borrowed it. They borrowed it. Is this a problem that's uh, <laughs> that's actually happening on a readily uh, larger scale? You know, I, this is a funny one that you should bring up. I saw that video too. Um, you know, as much as we can laugh and chuckle, the truth is this is becoming a serious issue uh, that I think fire departments, you know, again, I'm sure it's gonna elicit some laughs, but uh, I think fire departments actually need to start taking more seriously. Uh, as many know, IDEX is a, is a global company. So our colleagues over at Lucas, um, my colleague, uh, Max Wolt, uh, has, has essentially my same position uh, uh, covering the rest of the world over in Europe and stuff. And, uh, he showed me a video that, frankly, was downright scary. Uh, what had happened was a fire department had been robbed of its battery extrication tools. Uh, they cornered an armored vehicle. It was actually caught on film. Uh, this took place in Germany. And uh, holding armored car drivers at gunpoint uh, with automatic weapons, um, they then used the uh, extrication tools to breach the back of the armored vehicle uh, and made off with millions of dollars. I, I'll be honest, I don't know the end of the story if they ever caught him, but this is not a joke. This was very real. Now you'd think, okay, that crazy stuff only happens in Europe. Well, not at all. We've, uh, we had the incident, as, as you pointed out in the US, uh, one, uh, let's just say morally compromised person uh, borrowed a spreader from their fire department and proceeded to try to break into a change machine at a car wash. Um, I think that fits under Darwin Awards. He was caught on film and now resides in prison. However, we have seen, uh, we've seen uh, shipments of products stolen from the airport even. So I, what, I would, what I would recommend to any fire department is consider that now battery rescue tools are, you know, you see them on Chicago and other TV series. So average citizens know about this. I seriously recommend that fire departments ought to take a second look at their security protocols to secure their facility. Uh, because people, uh, you know, criminals and, and, and bad people who understand what these tools are capable of also understand that it, it, it can open the door uh, to use them for some, you know, some bad things. So I, I would simply ask the fire departments out there. We all had a laugh out of it. That, that, uh, the video is kind of, but uh, I, think, I think we all need to look to the future, which is um, more and more people are going to realize what you can do with these tools and it can present a security risk. So uh, in all seriousness out there, just lock the door. That's all I would ask. Make sure when you have, uh, when you, have uh, you know, on scene, uh, we've actually seen tools getting stolen out of the apparatus on scene. So I, I think all responders just simply ought to be aware of this. I think no department would want their tool used in a criminal act. So uh, just keep that in the back of everyone's mind. 
Yeah, I, I think that's a great message. And, uh, you know, I, I, when people are going to uh, locking ambulances and looking at uh, ways to keep trucks from getting stolen, I think that's a great piece to uh, to play is how, how to lock even maybe just the compartments of the apparatus so that you can help avoid that in the future as well. So uh, it's a shame they do it, but uh, I, I caught the video, it kind of was going viral there in, the, in a few areas, and uh, it's kind of comical to see a little laugh on a serious note as well. Yeah, well, it's funny. They say no press is uh, no press is bad press, but that's the one time I do not want to see our product uh, in the news. So we obviously not a proud moment, but it, it could have been anybody's spreader. And unfortunately, I think a lot of different spreaders uh, have been stolen out there. So, uh, you know, I think it's a I think it's a serious issue. We all need to, to take seriously. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us in the jump seat. I know uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here. I, I've learned a lot. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think I'm going to take back a couple uh, of these key pieces to my department and maybe we'll look at training a little bit differently. Uh, John, why don't you uh, take us through next week and I'll let you wrap it up for the day uh, with some of my uh, network issues that are going on here today. I'll let you close us out. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dave. And, and Mike, again, we appreciate your time and expertise. And, and the goal here with this live cast is to keep it interesting. And once again, I think we've done it. So, Mike, Mike, thank you for, for coming in. Um, next week, we're going to keep it interesting as well. Uh, we're, we're switching it up again. Uh, you can join us for episode seven. It's going to be with Jeff Van Meter from Hale Products to discuss uh, getting the most out of your truck's pump. So we're going to be talking pumps. We're going to be talking water flow. We're going to be talking optimizing your apparatus. So thanks again, uh, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, you can find and share this through our Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel uh, and the IDEX Fire and Safety blog. Um, you know, and, and we're always open to ideas and keeping things interesting. So uh, as we've always said it before, uh, you know, please let us know if you think of ideas or, or uh, other ways we can keep this going and, and spread the the information and knowledge out there to, to the world. So uh, everybody have a safe weekend. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next Friday.